hello there, Patreon uh, supporters. Thanks for joining us for the spoiler talk for The Starless Sea by Aaron Morgenstern. Livius, I don't even know where how to unpack this one. Um, there are so many things to say, but I think I want to start. Let's start with all the 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 characters or things we couldn't talk about on the other side. So, <laughs> um, I, I I I don't. There are so many cool concepts, and I guess. I'm looking, I have some notes. The Parliament of Owls is probably a good place to start. I don't know what fucking Owls did to Erin Morgenstern in, in her <laughs> in her youth or, or, or whatever, but the Owls are kind of terrifying. Yes. But not always, which is kind of interesting because there is that period where Zachary has his own owl that's like super cool. It's like this little owl just kind of guiding him along and yeah. then it fucks off and leaves. Yeah. Um, I think that like, yeah, my... This actually reminds me, I was driving to work one day and, um, there's, I same, I drive the same, same route every day. And one day there's a car that's like stopped like midway through their right turn onto another street. And I was like, oh, that's odd. And, uh, they're standing, they're, they're crouching on the ground, uh, in front of their car. And it looks like they're crouching and taking a picture or something with their phone. And I'm like, what is that little weird? It's like a little brown blur. And I was like, what the fuck is it? It was an owl. It was a, it was probably about an eight inch tall owl just standing almost in the road. And this, this Mm. person is just taking pictures of it. And I'm thinking, why don't you get the owl off the road or like shoot it away? So it doesn't get hit by a car. Yeah. He just stopped. It was taking pictures of it. I don't know that I've ever seen an owl. Right, it's not. A, I don't think that there's a lot of Midwest owls, so no. I, like I was, I was pretty surprised. I was like, man, because a part of me was like, oh, I get why he's trying to take a picture of these owls because mm-hmm. you never see them. But uh, yeah, that's uh, but that's my impression of owls is they just stand there and let people take pictures of them. They're <laughs> fucking birds of prey. Like they, they are, are yeah. they are <laughs> really deadly animals. <laughs> They, they, I mean, yeah, so they are, I mean, to like mice and shit. Like, I don't think there's a ton of like owl attacks. I could be wrong on that, but I don't know if they, they go after like, you know. I, but if you had like a small dog or a cat, it might be yeah, one Yeah, it could be. I mean, if you had a cat, it deserves it. Let's talk about cats. Oh my I God. could never go to the Starless Sea because apparently it's just littered in <laughs> fucking cats, which means I would immediately have some kind of allergic break, uh, break out and die. Um, but they're those cats. They're the cats that have personality. And I, I guess I want to touch on one of probably the most adorable moments in this book is, um, you know, there's a variety of cats uh, all, all over the the harbor. So when we say the Starless Sea, really, he's in the harbor for most of it, which is the buildings that, that border the Starless Sea. And there's a, one particular cat that's cat taking a liking to him and like sleeps in his room and stuff and he doesn't have any interaction with this cat he has that faux interaction where he says something and then assumes that the cat you know licks its paw in Mm. uh, agreement or whatever but there's that part where he actually says to the cat at the end that says you you can talk can't you and the cat responds no and walks away it's one of the most adorable moments in that book yeah (laughs) i agree they definitely uh uh, aaron morgenstern did infuse good personality on the cats that were used. Uh, and it wasn't just the one, there was several cats throughout. Um, and yeah, it was good use. And I was like, is it just a library slash book place thing? Having cats? Well, libraries probably don't have cats, but like your used bookstores and stuff. I think that that's kind of a, a trope of real life used bookstores is that you can find a cat in them or I don't know. Well, yeah. I mean, it's, it's uh, Shakespeare and company has a cat. Yeah. So, I think it just gives more of a lived in feel if you know that there's like life moving throughout it at all times. Um, So that's kind of what it made me feel like was like, this isn't just some building full of books. This is like more of a a space where things exist. That makes sense. Yeah. And there's, I mean, there's great stuff. I mentioned ribbons and these parts of stories that are written on ribbons or the little pages that have been torn out of books and folded into stars Mm -hmm. and just kind of scattered throughout the harbor. I mean, there is a lot of different ways that we looked at stories, because I think when you and I think stories, 
with the average person thinks stories you're picturing a book even if it's an ebook mm -hmm. right like you're still in your head you're thinking it's a book and we forget that that stories can be disseminated by um words you know word of mouth or um you know through um pictures or um apparently on strips of ribbons you know so there's this well there's a variety <laughs> a of flower. ways yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So um, it's kind of interesting that she didn't limit it to books. And I guess it isn't about books. And that's why I try to be careful how I said it, that they're protecting stories yep. uh, um, of all fashions. And the interesting thing, too, is that it 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 stemmed a little bit outside of just stories. Because, again, we think stories, we think written, uh, we think whatever. She really carefully looks at the stories around us, so the stories of other people. Mm -hmm. um, which is not something I don't think we think about. I don't actively think about like Rob has his own story. Rob's just a character in my story. I think that's how we, yes, how we operate ninety five percent of the time or more. And I thought it was really interesting the 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 work she did to uh, make us aware that there's a story literally everywhere we look. Yeah, and honestly, that's one of the more. Um difficult things that she pulled off in this book is um, how things connect to each other or influence each other um, having to do with the individual stories of people. So I have several thoughts and I hope I don't forget any of them, but um, for example, there's that we talked about the, the point where he reads about his, you know, the time there was that door painted in the alleyway. So he reads in the book, the thing that happened to him in real life. Um, later in the book, it comes back to that where Mirabelle is painting the door and runs into, uh, uh, Oh, what's her name? Madame love Rollins, Zachary's mm -hmm. mom. Yeah. And goes in and, uh, they have an interaction, which, uh, later on comes back when he sees that, Mirabelle's got the deck of cards, the tarot cards that he recognizes from his mom because she gave the cards to Mirabelle. So like this story, parts of the story influence other parts of the story at seemingly like just completely unanticipated times, but not in a way that ever felt forced. It didn't feel like, okay, she has an outline somewhere and she wanted this person to meet this person at this time. It just fit and it felt very natural. Um, and it, and it, and the effect of it was like, wow, that is so amazing how that all worked out. And, um, it makes you think back and have a deeper appreciation of those earlier moments. So for example, when, um, Mirabelle's talking to Zachary's mom, uh, she, after Mirabelle leaves, the mom reads the, the tea leaves or whatever in the, the glass that was left behind and has a very negative reaction. And you don't know why until like, 400 pages later when you mm -hmm. find out that like she probably saw Zachary die. I'm assuming that's what her reading of the tea leaves was. Yeah. Fucking amazing. <laughs> yeah, dude. I mean, look, I, you know, I guess this is a spoiler cause no one's gonna come listen to this first, right? It's been eight years. Um, since her last book, um, this is the kind of book, you have to deliver after eight years because less than this, you know what I mean? Wouldn't be yeah. good enough. <laughs> yeah. Um, Morgan Stern, I'm going to say this in my wrap up, but I'll say it here. She in her second published novel, I'll say that because who knows how many stories she's sure. told um, is a fucking master storyteller. Yeah. And I'm, <laughs> I'm going to go into something that I want to make sure that I'm not crazy. Mm -hmm. So I want to, I want to run this past you and see what you think about this. So, um, much like the way that we read the book itself, we start out with a lot of fables and a lot of really tight, simple stories that, um, you know, don't necessarily seem to have, uh, much of an impact on each other. Although they do kind of seem like they relate or like they might have something to do with each other, but in a very casual way, as the book goes on, the way that these stories interact or influence each other and stuff becomes more and more kind of crazy and harsher. So like at the beginning it's fairy tales. And even if the fairy tales are scary or dark or whatever, they still have that fairy tale quality. And as the book goes on, um, as the people we find out these people in real life are, you know, maybe people from these fairy tales, um, it gets weirder and, and 
more confusing and harsher. And that ties completely into the whole idea of this story was supposed to end. And for some reason it didn't. And it just keeps restarting. And like each iteration of the story is getting stranger and worse. And that's why Allegra wants to, well, that's why, uh, sorry, Mirabelle wants to stop it. She wants to finish the story or whatever you want to say about it. Mm -hmm. Whereas Allegra for whatever, you know, she, her love affair with this, this world and what it is makes her want to protect it and keep it from ending. And, and it all just ties together so fucking perfectly that I'm like, am I just making this up? Or do you think that she did that on purpose? I I I think you're right. Um, it, it definitely ramps up and, and it all starts out, right? Like you said it before, like it's like the six year old girl kind of picking flowers through right. the forest, adventuring, right? And she becomes the, the, the ship's captain on the on the starless sea, you know what I mean, who's yeah. out, you know, just doing her thing and exploring and picking up lost people. And yeah, for sure. Absolutely it ramps up. Um and, and probably uh to your point point i don't think it's something i thought about but the fact that the story was supposed to end probably causes you know the bees are fucking flipping out yep. at the end um the fucking bees that can make anything out of honey holy shit dude oh my god when i found out that the bees were the people from the kitchen mm-hmm. just fucking stick a fork in me man dude and it's awesome because they had this kind of funny personality too like yeah. this hive the hive mind for the bees no no pun intended was actually like kind of entertaining entertaining and 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 well done um i so maybe you can help me out with two things two things first of all what happened to the owl king i feel like that was left a little un unfinished yeah and well i think yeah i'm not as clear on that one and in my mind i kind of tied it up as like the Owl King was always a negative thing, right? Like a negative presence because I mean, from the way that the owls kind of took shit apart in the beginning, I don't know. Like, uh, but like, and then there was a whole thing about how the Owl King changes from person to person. Like Mm -hmm. you've come to kill me. It's your fate or whatever they said before, like that thing. Um, In that kind of final is the final scene that we see the Owl King, the time when, uh, it's dark, and uh, is it Simon? Yeah, no, I think okay. Simon. Le- Dorian. Dorian. I'm sorry. Dorian last sees the Owl King, I think, but it's left a little vague. Right, because it seems like the Owl King almost helps Dorian, and there's nothing Dorian. But like later, the next time we see Dorian, there's nothing changed. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think it was just kind of eh, whatever. Now, there, that's a possibility, and I'm going to say so. I, I want to go back to this other this other question <laughs> I had, but the possibility is that the Owl King will still be there for Cat, because that's yeah. definitely left wide open. Yes, for yep. So, um, who was the key collector? Was the key collector anybody? Because that story sticks out to me as left um, very wide open. I, well, I thought it was the keeper. But then subsequently find out that the keeper is time and the pirate. So I thought he could yep. be time and he could have been the key collector, but I don't think he could be the pirate, the key collector. <laughs> the- right. I didn't get the impression that the key collector was the keeper, mm-hmm. but I don't think that there's a different character that it fits. Yeah. Um, this will be one of those interesting ones. Cause you know, six weeks from now, some asshole on Reddit will have the entire <laughs> breakdown, the essay on this thing put together. Yeah, and, exactly. And, and I will go and read it. Um, what was your favorite fable? If you had to pick like one of the little fables, I was not ready for that. I almost started writing down like names of different stories as just kind mm-hmm. of like to keep my memory fresh on it. Um, I thought that, I was probably moved the most by the stuff that happened in the ballad of Simon and Eleanor, just because it was so like heart wrenching. Um, Mm -hmm. But again, since that's the third book, it's straying more toward real life and less, you know, far farther away from fable. So I I don't know. It's tough, but like, I think the girl with the door knocker one, if you want to talk about like straight up fable stuff for some reason, just felt like good to me. 
I don't know. What okay. about you? I mean, I, I'll be honest. I didn't find one that I didn't love. Yeah. Um, but my favorite one, the one that sticks with me most, is the innkeeper and the moon. Yeah. Oh man, because because you find out it's the moon like in the final line. Yeah, and, I mean, uh, don't get me yeah. wrong. I saw that coming. Uh, I didn't. <laughs> well, as he's telling her the story, she's like, "Are there any other stories about the moon?" And he's like, oh, "Yeah, the sun yeah. and the moon meet." And then this woman shows up, and she's got like blonde hair. And I was like, "This is the sun and the moon." Yeah. But her like um, her willingness to kind of stick around with him. Yeah. Like 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 she hooks up with him and stuff, and, and you know she she basically gives him the impression that she'll be back when she can. I was like, this is fucking brilliant. Yep. Th- this is like the best episode of the Twilight Zone ever. Is is this story right here? So I love that one, but I loved all of them, man. I yeah. like like you said, um, the Simon and Eleanor, you know, lovers uh, lost in time. You know, is fucking fantastic. Um, you know, the fact that they sired Mirabelle. Yeah. You know, yeah. is is terrific, and Mirabelle being the the you know the um, reincarnation, uh, you know the the, the body of yeah. fate over and over. Yeah, I mean, it's just, dude, well, what's not fucking love? And the fact that Dorian failed to assassinate Mirabelle because he stabbed her in the heart that she didn't have because yep. she is fate. Yep. Fuck me, man, that is good yep. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um. A couple, a couple more things that I, I, I'd like to talk about with you before um, we, we move out of this. Um, I really loved the cat shows up, like you know, in the fourth quarter with yeah. this real life story, bringing it back to us because it's some it. <sighs> Stories like this have a have a, a a rhythm, for the most part, right? Mm-hmm. It's normal person discovers supernatural thing gets sucked into supernatural world and and we never come back to the regular world or if we do it's it's dorothy waking up right and they say oh no you were knocked out because of the hurricane she's like but you were there and you were there right that that's a formula for these type of stories this took that exact route until cat yeah. And Kat's diary, where she brings it back to the things that are happening on this side, which I thought was a great, great touch. Um, even before she gets, even before she approaches a door, I thought it was great about, you know, how the, um, the, the, the collector club is after her, um, you know, her interactions with uh, Allegra and stuff. I thought that was a great way to remind us that this happens in our world and that things that happen in the fantasy world have real world consequences. I could not agree more. Um, and if you didn't bring it up, I was going to buy that time in the book. Cause that was the sixth of six parts. And then there's a, there's an afterward and everything. But by that time in the book, it was getting so fucking weird that it started to lose some of the luster because I was like, all right, well, we're just going on this crazy train off the cliff or whatever. And yeah, the cat's diary parts of the book really grounded me back into um, kind of zooming out into the overall story again. Um, so yes, I a hundred percent agree. Uh, that was a necessary part of the book and it was unexpected in the way that it ended up basically being, here's the start of the new story. I didn't see it coming. Um, because cat was not given much time in the book at all up to that point. But right. given enough significance that it totally makes sense. This is the one person who just wouldn't give up on um, the fact that Zachary suddenly disappeared. And um, the qualities of her wanting to find him match the qualities of the people who are kind of accepted in this world. So, again, man, like the storytelling is just fucking bulletproof. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I'm going to throw one out there at the end. Might put a ding in that bulletproof status. <laughs> Zachary is rescued by fate's heart, right? Uh, yeah, resurrected, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. Yes, resurrected would be a, a better way to put it. Um, so is he fate now? No. Okay. And here's why I say no, okay. because um, the owl, the king, got the the vision that it had from fate, right? When the owls destroyed fate. Yes. But it wasn't fate. It just gained magical powers from eating 
just devouring fate or whatever. Right. Okay. Because right. Mirabelle still exists and meets up with the keeper at the end of the book. So, right. Yeah. See, I just I wondered if fate was something that could be passed off kind of right. like the Owl King could. And, and I didn't have an answer. I didn't have a preformed answer. I was legit looking for guidance. <laughs> like, like, like if you know what? It, it's like the, the bird box question, right? If I had her yeah. and said, listen, <laughs> you can answer one thing for me. Listen, is this dude fate now? Exactly Come on, you fate. could tell me like that would be my. Yeah. Like, well, yeah. and the other argument against that would be that um, when she was talking to the keeper and they were they were talking about what what ends up happening to Zachary and she's like he didn't think i was going to i was going to let him have a happy ending and i'm pissed about it like that would mean oh yeah you know what I'm yeah that no, to I me think means I, you're right i forgot about that right. yeah so that that's pretty ironclad i'd say that bulletproof <laughs> i'm telling you i mean i was <laughs> this is the the wrap up is going to be um interesting to say the least so she obviously she mentions a lot of books and some of them in passing so we talked about you know um you know she acknowledges the cemetery of forgotten books and stuff um at one point a uh, waitress says i started that bird one but i couldn't get into it mm. she's talking to dorian and my first thought was bird box but then my second thought was the goldfinch well weren't they talking about chandler though raymond chandler no, because the waitress was just the the ditzy waitress. Like the waitress was a plot device, so okay. the cat could later find out that Dorian was. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I the Chandler was um cat. Ta- no, wasn't it? Was a cat? Who was it that was talking about Raymond Chandler? It wasn't this this no, ditzy waitress. Okay, you're right. It was something else. Yeah. So, and I don't um, think that there's a book that fits that anyway. So. Yeah. Um. So. Hmm. Oh, and then I don't know if you ca- did you catch the Chuck Wendig? No. Um, Kat is approached, God, I don't remember by who, but in her diaries, she's reading The Kick-Ass Writer. That's Wendig's oh. book on writing. Yeah. His I, I, mean, I think there are several volumes. But yeah, she mentions that she's just, she goes, oh, I'm just reading a copy of The, the Kick-Ass Writer or whatever she says. So that's a Wendig nod um, in nice. this book. Yeah. Um, I think that's all my notes. I mean, there's a couple things for, for the other side, but I, I think that's all I've got. Well, I'm willing and very open to the idea of, and we've never done this before, but we could do a spoiler part, spoiler talk part two, where we revisit the conversation if something comes up later that we uh, forgot to talk about. Oh, or, yeah. So we could. Yeah. I don't know. It sounds weird, but if it's worth it, we might we might try that. Yeah, I'm down for that. All right, yeah. we're gonna head back over. We're gonna talk a little bit more about this story and do our wrap ups and give this probably all the stars (laughs) that are missing from above the starless sea um, over on regular book. Thank you for being a supporter of this podcast. We love you guys so much. Um, Hell you guys are supporters. If you want us to do something like let us know, shoot us a message. I'm sure there's some kind of Patreon messaging thing, or you can email us at bookpodcast at gmail.com. Tell us if you like these or not. We don't get a ton of feedback on these, which makes me sad inside, but I'll be, if I'm being honest, like we put them on here, but I think we do it more for me and Rob than we do for anybody else. So (laughs) either way, thank you. And uh, we'll see you again uh, in a few weeks.